morning. We are blessed, and uh, we're grateful for sunshine, as Jerry said, but we're grateful for breath, aren't we? We woke up and we took a breath. You ate food if you felt like it. And how blessed we are to walk in the face of this earth and the Lord pouring so many blessings upon us. But on top of that, to have a God that has his arms open to us to love us and to bring us to himself, we are so blessed. May our eyes always be open to him. And again, the Deckers, we're so glad that you're, uh, you're among us, and uh, we won't go through the process uh, again with all the, the names, but hopefully we're going to get all those names down pretty good. I'm doing pretty good, I think, so far. But uh, we are blessed uh, with the presence of the Deckers and others that are among us. If you're visiting with us, we are really, really glad that you're here today. If you're online with us, we're glad that you're paying attention and uh, wanting to worship God, though you're apart from us. But we do look forward to the day when you'll be able to be with us uh, once again. So we are thinking about the spirit of obedience in our classes this quarter, and, and this is a very serious thing. It's not trivial. It has to do with trying to perfect ourselves before our God. And that's what we are as disciples, right? People who are trying to continue to perfect themselves and to be more glorious tools, meaning that we bring more glory to God by what we do. And this morning we talked about the idea that when we sin, what do we need to do about that? And there's much more to say about that, but today I'd kind of like to segue into that and use our opportunity to kind of think about that from the standpoint of this good old friend of ours that we know as Peter. And talk about Peter's denial and his response to to Jesus, to God, when he did deny Jesus and then talk about his, his walk in Jesus, or, or what did he do? I mean, this, the basic idea is, what did Peter do when he found himself in sin? Now, every preacher probably has his own sermon called the, the rooster moment, and this is, this is that sermon, you know, what do you do at that rooster moment? You know, what do you do when, when you're suddenly aware of your sin, and you have to make some decisions? And really, this sermon is very important for all of us, because the truth is, we're all sinners. We all continue in sin. Now, there's a difference between being a sinner in the world and someone who sins in Jesus. And sinners of the world have that as a core of their being, as it's a matter of lifestyle. Sin as a disciple is something, unfortunately, sometimes we stumble and we fall, but we get up and we go on. And that's what we want to talk about today and from the standpoint of Peter and his life. Now, we recall that we're looking towards the death of Jesus Christ, and Jesus is warning the disciples that the truth is that all of you are going to forsake me. Not all of you are going to, to be there standing up for me. That You know, it's going to be a tough day, it's going to be a tough time, and I'm going to be doing this alone. I mean, Jesus, really, his message is, no one will be with me. I will stand alone. But the disciples didn't like this message. We wouldn't like it either, would we? We're followers of Jesus. He's our mentor. And Jesus is is telling us, you're all going to leave me, and I'm going to have to stand alone and go to the cross without you being there as supporters. Uh, That that wouldn't go well with us. I I think we have to admit. And uh, we would be wanting wanting to say, because of the walk we've had with Jesus, no, Jesus, I'm going to to stand with you. But We, of course, know what what is going to happen. In Mark 14, Jesus said to them, All of you will be made to stumble because of me this night. I will strike the shepherd, it is written, and the sheep will be scattered. But after I've been raised, I will go before you to Galilee. So Jesus says, it's going to happen. You're all going to forsake me. You're all going to stumble because of me. Peter said, of course, it's not going to happen. Even if all are made to stumble, yet I will not be. Peter's got this bold declaration and bold belief in himself that he alone, if he has to, will be standing alongside Jesus while the whole world is against Jesus and even all of the other disciples turn against Jesus. So, you know, we admire the confidence that he has and the strength of his faith. But Jesus says, you're not listening, Peter. Assuredly, I say to you that today, even this night before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. So, Peter, you wanted the data on this, right? You're the one that started this direction, correct? 
let me tell you what you're going to do. You're going to deny me several times, as a matter of fact. You're going to deny me. We can actually look at what Peter did and, and see four, potentially five things he did in, in denying his Lord. But Jesus says it is going to happen. But of course, he spoke more vehemently. If I have to die with you, I, I will not deny you. What we often overlook is the next part of that verse. They all said, likewise. All the disciples felt this way. How could they possibly, walking day in and day out with Jesus, right now looking upon him in the fondness and great love of their hearts, how could they consider themselves as those, as those that would deny Jesus at his greatest hour of need? Well, right now, they didn't even understand that it's his greatest hour of need. Really, if you put the whole perspective, you know, into being right now, they didn't, need, they didn't know what was going to be going on. They didn't know the totality of the package. But they had that spirit of dedication. And, you know, that's a, that's a sweet thing. But, of course, it's, it's an unreal thing. Of course, it is quite normal for disciples to overestimate their strength. We can all do that, right? These disciples overestimated theirs. Peter saying, I'm never going to deny you. It's easy to believe on ourselves and, you know, just have this attitude that uh, nothing is going to defeat me. I can get through anything. I can face any temptation and I can get over it. Well, hopefully we've learned a lot in our discipleship to realize I'm going to have to be very careful with how confident I am in my faith. Now, faith should have its confidence, but it should be a real confidence. Uh, We need to understand, God says, you're not going to be perfect. Faith should never say, I am perfect and I will be perfect. The truth is, 1 Corinthians 10, verse 12, teaches us, therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed. Because about the time you think, I can handle this, I'm strong enough to take this, God says, you're going to fall. You better take heed. Because you can fall now. This is part of being that fickle human, right? This is part of the, yeah. Wouldn't it be great, you know, to build a strong structure? And, and you always know exactly what you're going to do, but unfortunately we have that fickleness that kind of lives in us sometimes and sometimes sins around the corner. Take heed. Let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. Now, Peter kind of exhibited some signs perhaps. Uh, there are beautiful, impressive things about Peter, but perhaps he exhibited some signs that he's not really a pillar yet in what God would like him to be and what Jesus would like him to be. His denial, his denial, his, uh, denial was really pretty predictable from one standpoint. If you see the indifference when Jesus had asked his disciples, I want you to, to come over here and pray with me. You know, he's hours from death. It's his great hour of need. The disciples know Jesus has been really getting intense uh, lately. They, they know where Jesus is going in his teaching. He's been very, very focused And here Jesus is, he's invited Peter, James, and John to to go over here and to to watch with him. But, of course, he goes over and Jesus is in his sadness and he's in his his bringing forth uh, sweat and blood and sweat and the great agony, that mental agony that he is in. He comes back and he finds Peter sleeping. And uh, most of us would say, well, I understand that. I'd be sleeping too. You know, the schedule of the disciples, I would have been sleeping I would have been snoring right next to Peter. You know, I mean, who, who would have been louder? Um, we see an understandable perspective here, but notice that Jesus doesn't seem to be too understanding, does he? They're really fatigued. Day in, day out, scheduling and walking with the Savior. And what Jesus is accomplishing on earth, they had to be dog-tired like soldiers who on a march, it's known that they would stop and they would be asleep within five seconds. Stop. And they'd sleep for five minutes, wake up and go on. That's, you can imagine the disciples. But when Jesus saw them sleeping, he didn't go easy on them. What? Are you sleeping? Could you not watch one hour? And of course, he went away and, you know, came back again and they're asleep. They did not know what to answer. And he came a third time. Are you still sleeping and resting? And what this tells us is there's no excuse in their fatigue. If, that, if this had meant to them what it had meant to Jesus, they would not have been sleeping at that moment. Now, 
They could have put, put a bag of water over their shoulder. They could have been walking around and praying if they had understood, if, you know, but the truth is they just didn't get the big picture and they just weren't a, as attuned to what Jesus was doing and they didn't, they didn't have that strong focus. And yeah, they had that little bit of spirit of indifference compared to what Jesus was, of course, going through. So we see something going on, you know, with Peter and the disciples. And we see, you know, what, what we might call an obtuse misfire. <laughs> you know, what, what do I mean by that? You know, so often the, the disciples didn't get Jesus. They were just obtuse, like thick-headed. And Jesus would explain to this, explain what he's going to do, and, and they wouldn't get it. They didn't really understand that he was going to go die. They didn't know what all of that, all of that meant. Uh, they didn't really understand. I don't think they could even bring it home, you know, as to what a denial was going to, to be. But here is Jesus, or here is Peter in his, his ignorance, and Peter not getting the big picture of what Jesus is going to do. Uh, here is Peter then firing the weapon in ignorance. Get the idea? He's not even firing on knowledge. Jesus says, I have to go die. Peter says, you're not going to die. I'll defend you. He picks up his sword, and he's going to defend him. And that was a, an obtuse misfire from one standpoint. Now, we give Peter, of course, tremendous credit here because he did pick up the sword. He did go to battle with Jesus. Let's not forget that Peter had the intention that he was going to stick with Jesus. But he did evidently have some confusion. He faced some confusion when Jesus said, take up your sword, put it away. And that's not the point here. And we're going to see after this that he, well, he just follows along with everybody else. It's like he kind of lost his structure. In fact, really, he felt a fear just like everybody else. Jesus answered and said to them as they were coming to take Jesus, have you come out against a robber with swords and clubs? I was daily with you in the temple teaching, and you did not seize me, but the scriptures must be fulfilled. And then it says that they all forsake him. Now, we know why they forsake him as humans. It was the fear of the moment. What else would it be? They panicked. The soldiers are here. They're coming after Jesus. Affiliation with Jesus means something. It's time for us to take a few steps back. And that was all about fear. Peter ultimately was in this picture as well. They forsook Jesus as fear came to dominate what they would be facing. And so we see Peter then denies what Jesus said that he would do. Uh, Peter fulfills, I should say, the denial that, that, uh, that Jesus talked about. Back in Mark 14, Peter followed him at a distance right into the courtyard of the high priest. And he sat with the servants and warmed himself at the fire. Now Peter was below in the courtyard. One of the servant girls of the high priest came. And when she saw Peter warming himself, she looked at him and said, You also were with Jesus of Nazareth. But he denied it, saying, I neither know nor understand what you are saying. And he went out on the porch and a rooster crowed. If Peter was paying close attention, he should be starting to remember the words of Jesus. But we're not done, of course. Mark 14, he went out on the porch and a rooster crowed, and the servant girl saw him again and began to say to those who stood by, this is one of them, but he denied it again. And a little later, those who stood by said to Peter again, surely you are one of them, for you are a Galilean, and your speech shows it. Look, there's a whole lot of evidence that Peter was one of these guys, right? People are, they know what the evidence is. He began to curse and to swear. Put yourself there. Lord, if everybody else denies you, I will not deny you. He began to curse and to swear. I do not know this man of whom you speak. And, of course, we began to see that Jesus was correct, of course. Luke twenty two sixty. 60, Man, I do not know what you are saying. And immediately while he was still speaking, the words were in his mouth, the rooster crowed. And then we have what had to be one of the most poignant 
moments on the face of the earth throughout all of human history. Can't think of anything that would top this one. Where one of Jesus, one of uh, one of Jesus' greatest servants, has to make eye contact with him for having just denied him several times. Jesus was correct. Jesus eyes his so-called disciple. And the disciple gets to bring home the full conviction of the glance of his Savior. And so we have then the denial of Peter, of Jesus. It says in Mark 14, 72, when he thought about it, he wept. Luke 22, 62, Peter went out and he wept bitterly. To weep bitterly. Everybody's wept bitterly, right? When you have been overtaken in the core of your being with, with, with that emotion and, and the tears come out uncontrollably and you sob and it's a whole body experience. It's like when, not like when you have allergies and you've got a few tears coming out. He wept bitterly. Well, Peter had stumbled, of course. Peter had found out that uh, he had not taken heed as he should have taken heed. You know, take heed lest you fall. He thought a little bit more about his faith and then was actually there. Peter stumbled, and the truth is, of course, we know that we're all going to stumble. We have seen this, seen this in our Bible class, we've seen it in many Bible verses. This is part of the discipleship reality and journey, unfortunately. Not that it's planned by God, but God did plan for our weakness. 1 John 1, we of course are told, if we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. If we say we've not sinned, then we make God a liar. Guess what? Falling sometimes is going to be a part of our discipleship. James 3 and verse 2, if we all, we all stumble in many ways, for if anyone does not stumble in word, he's a perfect man. And again, I don't know too many perfect people, and I certainly don't see one in the mirror. But here is the here is the, the stumbling nature of the disciple. And you know, hopefully we get to the point where we stumble less and less and less and less. But what God says is, you're going to stumble. You are going to have these things in your journey. Peter stumbled. We're going to stumble. The question is, what do we do when we stumble? And that's what we're looking at here as we think about Peter. So what did Peter do here? Here he is, has stumbled he is actually denied, you know, God forbid, I would never do this. Ah, there's the deed, the deed is done. What did Peter do? Well, let's think about three things here. Number one, when it says that he wept bitterly, there were a couple things, there are a couple things that, that connect into this with where he is going in view of the whole situation. Number one, he had an epiphany. That doesn't mean a message from God, that doesn't mean Aliens coming down and knocking you in the brain or anything like that. He'd had an epiphany. That's that flash of knowledge that hits you and now you get it. We all have epiphanies all the time, you know. He's had that, that epiphany. And so he weeps bitterly. He's come to have that flash of knowledge. He knows he has denied his very Savior. You know, this moment of epiphany is really, really all, all important for all of us. That moment of, of turning on the switch of knowledge, and you get it. It's kind of like, you know, when you've, you've driven all the way to the store, right when you're turning off your car, remember, you don't have your bank card. You know, it's like, ah, epiphany, yeah. Uh, or it's like the woman that has, man, I've just been feeling so bad for the last several weeks, and all of a sudden it hits her. I'm pregnant. Epiphany, you know, and... And it's like someone who is, is in sin, and, and then one day it hits them. I'm a sinner. What does all that mean? And all the gravity of that comes home, and, and it comes right down on the shoulders. That's what had happened to Peter. Now, this is a matter of being honest with self and facts and opening our eyes to see. Revelation 3 and verse 8 is all about epiphany, if you will. Open your eyes to have that knowledge come to you, that you'll, you'll receive it. Where he says, I counsel, you to, I counsel uh, you to buy from me to the Laodiceans, gold refined in the fire, that you may be rich 
and white garments that you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed, and anoint your eyes with eyes have, so that you might see. Open your eyes to see. You know, the epiphany we're talking about is when you finally allow yourself to open your eyes to see what you have done. And now it takes a lot of honesty to do that, right? A lot of people spend their lives trying not to open their eyes to what they do. A lot of people spend their lives trying to cover it up, not, not think about it. But for the disciple, there has to be that epiphany. There has to be that moment where the light comes and you see it and you know it and you're honest with it. That's where Peter was. And unfortunately, if you're really honest, you're going to let something into your life that you don't really much, you might not like it much. That's the word horror. Here's the horror. And you can imagine the horror of Peter. I did it. And I really deny my Lord for him to go and weep bitterly. You know, it all brings home the, the terribleness of what all of this was to Peter. But secondly, in, in Peter, when he went out and wept bitterly, what that signifies for us as we look at this with the whole life of Peter was that he was very, very convicted in what he had done. He was convicted. He was guilty as charged. And there was nothing he could do to deny that. The man was guilty, and he brought home the conviction to himself. Now, when we look at conviction, we're looking at the idea of two things happening at least. In conviction, there's something is going to have victory over us. Now, we remember that, that V-I-C in there, convict, V-I-C-T, comes from the word victory. That victory is in this word. Something has victory. Con with victed, victory. Something has had victory over us. What has had victory over us? You know, what, what was going on with Peter? You know, understanding sin. Well, number one, there was a victory of actuality of what really was over deception. You know, Peter could have sat there and, de and deceived himself, and he could have tried to cover all of this up. But actually, actuality and reality had victory over any possible deception. Now, there's something else that works with that. That truth has victory in persuading one of his own sins, persuading the sinful heart that he's been guilty of sin. And this is what John 16 and verse 8 is talking about. When he has come, the Holy Spirit, he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness. The Holy Spirit convicts us all the time. The Holy Spirit is trying to have victory over us. Yes, his own personal victory, but he's the idea of revealing his word so that the word will be persuasive to us. It will have victory over our own principles. It will make us to understand what we are, and we will then follow the word and, and know God. When we talk about being convicted, we are talking about listening to the Holy Spirit so that we will see the truth and let that truth have victory over us and see actuality and reality around us so that we do not just dovetail right into our deceptions to try to, to do away with, with what is. Both of these are very important to our being convicted and they're very important in the operation of, of, of a Christian. If, if these things are not in operation, you know, really, well, we just don't really leave sin because as we become convicted to reality and can convicted by the truth, you know, we just cannot hide sin from self anymore. There comes that time you can't hide it. That's actually a wonderful feeling. But you understand as a Christian what that really means. I can't hide from my sin anymore. It's time to get rid of it. It's time to face up to it, see it for what it is. It's time to get rid of it. This is what heaven is all, is all about. This is, this is what the life of a saint, of disciples, this is what it's all about. So conviction is very important. Now, unfortunately, once you become convicted and the guilty verdict has been rendered by your conscience, <laughs> the guiltiness then brings the guilt. Guiltiness brings the guilt, and the guiltiness now makes me, now I really, really feel bad. Thus, we have 
to go out and wept bitterly. Now, by the way, guilt has a good purpose, right? When used properly, these are all God's inventions. Guilt is a great thing. Thank you, Lord, for guilt. Whenever you do what you know is bad, guilt. It's God's pressure saying, leave that and do the right thing. Now, unfortunately, some people take their guilt and they deal with it the wrong way. And for some, it's to cover it up. For some, it's to stuff it. Try to ignore it. And don't ever deal with guilt. Uh, we are guilty. We're going to feel guilt. But actually, that's a blessing to receive the shame that comes from our wickedness. So now what? You know, we, we go back to Peter. And we see that he's guilty of sin. He's been convicted. He's, he's had the epiphany of what he is. No more lying about, I know, Jesus, I would never, you know, no, no more of that self-deception. At this point, we come to Peter and Judas, and we realize they both kind of came to a similar point. Judas, too, had had the epiphany. Judas, too, had had one side of conviction of the reality of what he had done. But there's a big difference between what Judas did and what Peter did. Judas went out and hung himself. How do you deal with guilt? That's exactly how many people deal with their guilt. They kill themselves. It hurts too much. And how sad because you know, God has done all that he has to fix all things and to eradicate guilt and to eradicate then the shame that comes with the guilt so that one can walk with God in full joy and then walk in the future in eternal life with God. This is what God has been doing. How, how sad for someone to totally miss that whole picture and in their remorse and in their sadness say, my only, my only option is to do myself in. That was Judas. But yet we have Peter, on the other hand, who's going to show great repentance. And he's going to go on to glorify Jesus with his life. Big difference between these two individuals. Now, as we look at Peter, we're not going to find a verse that says, you know, and Peter got down on his knees and he repented of his sins and he was sorry. You know, we're not going to find that verse. However, when we look at Peter's life, we find repentance was all over it. And, and some statements that Jesus made shows he knew that, that Peter was going to repent. Luke 22 I had prayed for you, Jesus says, that your faith should not fail, looking up to his denial. When you have returned to me, strengthen the brethren. So he knows that Peter's going to fall, but he knows that Peter's going to make his life right. He knows that Peter's going to take up the cause of Christ once again, and he is going to be serving the Lord. And he also says in John 21, remember what he, he's resurrected and he's dealing with Peter? He's really reinstating Peter into the role of, of being this very important servant from some respects. But in John 21, he's asking Peter, do you love me? And remember, Peter at first doesn't want to use the same words as Jesus. Jesus is using a very perfect word for love. And Peter wants to respond by lowering the standard of love. That's, that's another word for the first two questions. Jesus, do you love me? Peter says, well, you know, Lord, I really, really like you. Jesus asked again, do you love me? You, yes, Lord, you know, you, I really like you. And the third question is, Peter, do you really like me? And at that point, we understand Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? This time using the inferior love because we understand Peter's remorse, don't we? How could I talk about great perfect love before my Lord Jesus Christ when I just told people, I don't know the man, and he cursed and he sweared? We get that. And this is normal, isn't it? It, it truly is normal as a human. It, it takes a while. You know, you sin against your God. It takes a while to, to feel good about that, about that again. But we have to trust in his forgiveness. Jesus is willing to forgive, and he's, he's willing to receive Peter back into his service, and as Peter is coming back and he's coming to his love, Jesus says, here's what I expect of you, feed my sheep. So we know that Peter, of course, we look at the books of First and Second Peter, we, we realize he repented. 
of his sins, he made his life right, and he followed his God. Now, the beautiful thing about Peter is that he really shows us what a full repentance is. Sometimes I think we think about repentance as getting sin free again. Right? I'm a sinner and I need to repent of my sins. What does that mean? I need to get rid of my sin. Repent. I repented and now I'm sin free again. Is that true? That is true, isn't it? But is that the whole picture? You see, when we have left the satanic direction of walking in life, repentance is a turn wherein we come towards God. And it's not just to get sin free. It is to take up God and to walk in God in the things of God. A repentance, a life of repentance is one that does not do satanic works anymore. It is a life that does the works of God. Free of sin? Yes, by the blood of Jesus. It's part of the package. But you see the totality of a life of, of repentance, works of of repentance. Now we're talking about a life that is now moved in the direction of God and is going in that direction. And thus we have Peter's future as we look, you know, we could look to the past and see what he did, but this is what Peter will become. He will stand up to find a replacement for Judas. He will preach the first sermon in Acts the second chapter. He will heal the lame man, Acts 3. He will be arrested in Acts 4. In Acts 5, he will be beaten and then he will depart from the council, rejoicing that he had been beaten. Do we see a man who's had a life repentance? You know? Can you imagine going along joking with your friend, you know, who's been beaten too? We just got beaten for Jesus, and they're, you know, they're giddy about it, and they're happy, you know. I don't know exactly how that was, but they rejoiced that they had been beaten and suffered dishonor for the name of Jesus Christ. We realize, of course, that he's going to be expected to die for Jesus. John 21, 18, Jesus himself told him, when you were younger, you girded yourself, walked where you wished. That's a great feeling when you're younger and you can do that. When you are old, you will stretch out your hands and another will gird you and carry you where you do not wish and the text informs us that Jesus was talking about that he would glorify God, the matter of death with which he would glorify God. So Peter is going to die for the Lord. And, and Peter echoed this in 2 Peter chapter 1. I think it's right as long as I am in this tent to stir you up by reminding you, knowing that I must, shortly I must put off this tent. So he's aware he's going to die. So here is Peter who who has shown this repentance. Yeah, he got himself. There's no doubt he got, you know, Lord, please forgive me. You know, he taught that in Acts, the book of Acts, uh, the idea of, of uh, repentance and, and uh, forgiveness of sin and seasons of refreshing that come from the presence of the Lord in his own ways throughout the book of Acts. But here is Peter that has shown now the fruit of repentance in the entirety of what he is. This is what repentance is. It is the turn one has made from the satanic ways to the godly ways and living for God. So here's repentance in Peter. It's the change and it's the learning and, and going forth to, to glorify God. And for all of us, there's the need for us to live this kind of life. We need to repent. We need to change we need to leave behind the things that are wicked. We need to come to the truth and do these things that are true. We need to leave sin, and we need to find forgiveness in God. We understand these things, and, you know, this is all over the Scripture. We, we understand our role as far as this is concerned. We need to learn from our experience. We need to figure out how we can become better from the sinful experience that I had, like Romans 13 and verse 14 uh, Put you on the Lord Jesus Christ and make not provision to fulfill the lust of the flesh. There's something that you can learn. You know, this situation brought me into sin. Well, don't make provision to fulfill the lust of the flesh. Don't provide yourself the situation to fulfill the lust of the flesh. So you say, well, this is what got me into sin before. Now I know better. 
what do you do? You, you learn from it. But we do want to learn from it, right? We, we do want to bring that home. So we learn from our experience. And we begin to think of future in Jesus because this is what the life of, remember, the life of repentance is all about what I'm going to give to my Lord. It's not just, I'm clean now. Whew. It's about a life given to God. Will we give our lives to God? What is my future going to have in it? Is it going to have works for the Lord? Is it going to be filled with light? This is what God is expecting from us. Revelation 2, he told the Ephesians, repent and do the first works. Repent and get back to doing the things you're supposed to be doing as a Christian. See, that's what we're looking at. Seeing our lives as a turn to God, wherein we give glory to God in all that we see. Now, in all of this, we, we see how we can fail without being a failure, right? If you understand, Christianity is all about failing without failure, without becoming a failure. In other words, we're going to stumble, but we don't have to quit. We're going to stumble, but we don't have to, to stay there and never get up again. The truth is we're going to stumble, and just like anybody doing any particular sport, you, you failed, you did something wrong, you're on the long horse, you're on the rings, you're on the parallel bars, and you fail, and you stop thinking, what, you start thinking, what did I do to cause that fall? How did my hand miss that? And how did my hand let loose of that high bar as I was doing that flip around it? It's not going to happen again. I'm going to make sure I, I learn from that. And so we all look to our lives and we, you know, what do I have to do to keep from doing this sin again? This is all growth in the direction of creating a future that is going to be glorifying to Jesus. Yes, in, in sinlessness, number one, but in also in glorifying Jesus, living in the light, very importantly, number two. So there's so much more to talk about, of course, uh, about Peter. And uh, today, I'm, you can be thankful because I I said no to myself. Sometimes I can't say no to myself. I just got to talk about it. You know that, but uh, we're looking at these basic things. They're so very important. Peter gives us the, the model of the human truth relationship. And it is the model of sometimes we're going to fall. That doesn't mean we give into it, do it on purpose. It's not the point. Sometimes we are going to fall. We must uh, let our fall hit us deeply. We should have epiphany and conviction, and we should have tears in our fall as we are aware of what we've done. We must repent by getting up and, and going forward, even as Peter did. And we must, we must use our fall as the springboard for a greater glory in Jesus. I don't want this to happen again. And I want this springboard to, to take me in a direction of growth where I'm going to serve my Lord more than I've ever served Him before, not bringing Him dishonor and shame, bringing Him glory by the way that I live my life. So we think about that rooster moment with, with Peter, and we're glad that we have that, that rooster moment. He really brings home our humanity for all of us, right? <clears throat> it brings home how we succeed. It brings home that we can make mistakes and fail, but we don't have to be failures. It brings us home we can just turn it around and make sure we keep driving forward it brings home that we can actually become valuable tools for God. Yes, I know God is God. He's God Almighty. But we can become valuable tools for God on the face of this earth. That's the way He wants it, to make you as valuable as He possibly can, as effective as He possibly can, so that you can bring greater glory to God and be that light to that lost and dark world. Peter gives this model to us, and it's for us to take and to realize I can be better today, and, and I'm going to do that. And uh, when was the last time you sinned? Make sure it's going to be a long time before the next one, right? If you know you're already going to sin today, you've got a problem, okay? We have, we have to work on that. We better be determined that I'm going to stay away from sin. You know? but, but hey, if... If you are aware of, of where your life is, just give the invitation today. If you've been involved in sin and you haven't come out of that, you need to repent of your sins. You need to put on the hope of eternal life and the glory be to God. He makes all of that possible for you to do that.
It's an opportunity today for you to, to get right with God. Maybe you haven't turned your life, maybe you misunderstand what, misunderstood what repentance is all about and, and getting a life that's directed towards God and doing the will of God. Maybe you're just kind of trying to be stuck in a little clean vacuum where you're sinless, but you're not really doing the will of God. You need to get out of that. You need to realize what repentance is. You need to move forward and you need to obey the Lord your God. You know, all things are ready. There's water right here. You can be baptized in Jesus Christ. The blood is ready. The only thing, you know, that, that you have to do is repent of your sins. Have faith, motivated by faith, repent of your sins. Come confessing Jesus Christ. Be baptized. And you can walk away in newness of life, rightness with God, and eternal life. How blessed we are. So, where are you? You need to obey the Lord. Why not use this opportunity and do that right now? And together we stand.